Have you noticed the young people when they're 16, 17, 18 years old, they look so strong and vibrant. They look so good. But then when they're 26, 27, 28, and they've been living a life of sin, have you seen the grasp? Have you seen the horrible effects of sin? People whose bodies are just destroyed. We're continuing in our study in the Gospel of John. We're in chapter 12, uh, beginning at verse 12. We're going to be talking about the Lamb, and I'm going to encourage you to behold the Lamb. Jesus has entered Jerusalem in the face of danger to celebrate the Passover. And indeed, he is the Passover Lamb himself. As he comes into Jerusalem, he rides a donkey, humbly entering the city as the savior. Not a savior from political uh, tyranny, although he does that in the hearts of those who trust him, but he's a savior from the tyranny of sin and the grasp that sin has on people and the horrible effects that sin has on people. Have you noticed it? Have you noticed the young people when they're 16, 17, 18 years old, they look so strong and vibrant. They look so good. But then when they're 26, 27, 28, and they've been living a life of sin, have you seen the grasp? Have you seen the horrible effects of sin? People whose bodies are just destroyed. All marked up with tattoos and ear things and stuff hanging all over and body modifications to make themselves marring the image of God, the beauty that the Lord made. And, you know, people are beautiful. You go look at the little kids around Onaway here. you, You see a bunch of pretty little kids, you know. But sin will mess you up. Jesus came to set us free from that sin. And the people joyously greeted him with palms waving, shouting Hosanna, which means save us. And blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And so we're in chapter 12 and we will begin reading in verse 12. You follow along with me. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and they went forth to meet him and they cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. And these things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause, the people also met him, for that they had heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees said, uh, therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. All right, let's pray for a minute. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask you to guide our hearts and minds now. O Holy Spirit, be our teacher, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, the scripture is fulfilled in Christ as he came into Jerusalem on that donkey. Even the minute details of Christ's coming, those minute details were fulfilled by Christ. It's important to note that Jesus is the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. He was expected by the prophets. 
He's the Messiah of the Holy Scriptures. Jesus is Zion's king. And though he comes slowly on this little donkey, he does come to comfort and to save his beloved ones. And what's a fitting response to the response to the coming of Jesus? It's rejoicing. Here's the Savior. He's here. Jesus is here. That makes me happy. I was happy when I saw you guys come up from Florida. Oh, they're here. Hooray, they're here. What would you think if you showed up and I said, oh, no, they're here. <laughs> oh, no. Or if I was just ambivalent, just like, no, they're here. So what? Jesus is here. And there is great cause for rejoicing. Fear not is a call that comes out from under the shadows of gloom and doubt. And there are many uh, reasons to rejoice um, because Jesus has come and the sunlight of his uh, God's salvation is shining on us. Jesus is here and that should make us happy. It's a wonderful day. It's a wonderful day when Jesus shows up. He's come to save and it's time to shout for joy. I want to speak about a common misunderstanding. It's a great comfort to me to read that Jesus' disciples, his closest companions on earth at that time, uh, even they didn't know what was happening all the time. They didn't get it about the donkey and the hosanna and the palm branches until later. That is, oh, hey, I remember this was, that makes me feel good. Um, it's common for those of us that are Christians to be unclear on things. Those of you who are older, you know that. Sometimes we won't understand until we're down the road away and we look back and we see the Lord's hand in things. And uh, we are often a little bit on the clueless side as far as God's plans and his methods. I think this is why it's important that we search the scriptures daily and we know the word of God. And I think there's another thing that uh, is good for us. When we look back and we remember the miraculous things that God has done for us, we can see his faithfulness. Yesterday, I don't know the circumstances of it because you guys were praying for somebody who was sick. And Joel got a text on the phone. He said, okay, let's stop and pray. And so everybody stopped. I didn't know what they were praying about because I didn't know the situation. And Joel just prayed and he thanked the Lord for answering some prayer that they made for somebody who was sick and there was some kind of blockage and the Lord answered quickly. I don't know about you, but that's a common thing for Christians to have the Lord answer their prayers quickly. Can anybody say amen to that one? Yeah, the Lord answers quickly. Um, if the Lord isn't answering quickly, maybe you ought to examine yourself <laughs> to see if there's something causing a blockage there. But you know what? We see the Lord moving. We want, we want to understand scriptures. We want to see what the Lord is doing in, in, personally in our own life. You know, there's another thing uh, that is a common misunderstanding. Many Christians think that when they're walking right with the Lord, then everything will go right in their life and all that. But I got to tell you something. Most of the time, if you're walking right with the Lord, you're going to receive opposition from, from the false religionists that are living around us. And that's what was happening with Jesus. Here he is. He's coming into Jerusalem. He's on the donkey. They're all saying, hooray, hooray for Jesus. He's here. They're all happy. And then, then here are these old false religious leaders standing over in the corner, muttering and spitting and, and angry. That's what's going to happen. But Jesus has entered Jerusalem to the applause and the praise of many. They proclaim him king and Messiah, their savior, savior from sin, not from the Romans. And because of the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead, it isn't, it's interesting to me, I guess I never saw the story of Lazarus tied in with the triumphal entry, but it is. One of the reasons they're, they're so happy is because Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead. 
And uh, although the Bible doesn't say it, you think maybe Lazarus was there in the crowd walking with him, maybe behind the donkey. <laughs> People would say, hey, here's Jesus. Oh, look, there's Lazarus. <laughs> he was dead. And Jesus brought him back to life. It was because of the miracle of the raising of Lazarus from the dead that many people followed him. And these things just unnerved the false religious leaders. Lazarus particularly was a problem for them. So much so that they wanted to kill him too. Isn't that amazing? You want to kill Lazarus? Why? What did Lazarus do? He just came back to life. Well... They throw their hands up and they say, the whole world has gone after him. We've lost. Hmm. Really? The whole world went after him? I wish it would have. But they were exaggerating, weren't they? It's sad that the Pharisees were not correct in their lamentation for the whole world did not and has not followed Christ. And the very testimony of these false religious leaders proves that. But I want you to notice something in verse 20. I really like this part. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came, this is verse 21 now, the same came, uh, therefore, to Philip, which was a Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again, Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And then Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die and abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. And I'm going to stop right there. Those words are not difficult to understand, are they? I was talking to somebody this week that was talking bad about the King James translation, you know. How hard it is to understand. <laughs> I don't know. What planet are you on? Is this hard to understand? How about this one? If any man serve him or serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. That's pretty simple. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. What's hard about that? It's pretty simple to understand. What about these Greeks? Who were they? Well, some people think that they were Hellenistic Jews who had come to the Passover. Others seem to think that they were more like Cornelius, who would have been just Greeks who were honoring and revering the God of Israel. That, to me, seems to be the plainest meaning of the text. I don't know who these Greeks were, but it does say they were Greeks. And um, I believe that they were most likely uh, non-Jewish worshipers of God like Cornelius, although I can't be sure who they were. But anyway, they're called Greeks. They're differentiated from the Jews, and they want to see Jesus. Now, what's wrong with that? That's a good thing. These Greeks desired to see Jesus at the Passover. Now, this story is uh, uh, interesting to us. Because Jesus has come to Jerusalem for a purpose. He has not come to meet the Greeks. He's come to die on the cross. That's why he's there. And Isaiah 53 is the Old Testament uh, prophecy about the dying lamb. And I'll read it for you. 
Let me read it in my Bible that my sister gave me. Isaiah 53, if you'll turn there, and we'll go through verses uh, 1 through 12. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he, he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. This is Isaiah talking about Jesus so clearly. It's my understanding that in a lot of synagogues in the world today, they don't read Isaiah 53. Because it's so clearly about Jesus. The evangelist Philip, in Acts chapter 8, he preached Christ from this text. He didn't need the New Testament. He had the Old Testament. He had Isaiah. He preached Christ from here. John the Baptist pointed to Jesus very clearly. You remember in John chapter 1, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is why Jesus had come. Not only the Greeks here at this Passover desired to see Jesus, but there were many people who wanted to see Jesus. Just a couple of days before this, there was a little guy named Zacchaeus who wanted to see Jesus. He was so short he couldn't look over the other people, so he had to climb up that sycamore tree. Why? Because he wanted to see Jesus. Short people want to see Jesus. Tall people wanted to see Jesus. Jews wanted to see Jesus. Greeks wanted to see Jesus. They all wanted to see him. They all wanted to behold him. Let me ask you this. Do you want to see Jesus? Do you want to behold him? That word behold is good. Behold the lamb. It means to seriously and intently and intensely Think about something in some way. Study him. Look at him. Study him. I'm going to give you three pictures of Jesus. Are you ready? And these are things that I want you to study. I want you to think. I want you to behold. I want you to roll it over in your mind and, and think about these three pictures. The first picture I want you to think about, you would find in Genesis chapter 4. There's two boys out in the field. One's name is Cain, one's name is Abel. And Abel brings an offering to the Lord, an offering of a little lamb. 
that is slain. And God accepts that offering. He doesn't accept Cain's. He gave respect to Abel's lamb, not to Cain's fruit. The lamb. That was the only acceptable sacrifice. Cain's fruit was unacceptable. But the lamb was acceptable. You see, Cain had sin in his heart, didn't he? He was mad at Abel about the lamb and that his fruit was not accepted. His heart wasn't pure. Okay, the story of Cain and Abel, you know what it teaches us? That pure heart plus a lamb equals eternal life. (laughs) A pure heart Plus the lamb that dies, the sacrificial lamb, equals a pure heart. I'll give you another formula. You ready? A pure heart, or an impure heart, rather, and hard work equals death. You need to have your heart right with the Lord and trust the lamb. Behold the lamb. That's the first picture. Here's the second picture of the lamb. It's found in Genesis chapter 22, and we're going to walk up a hill with Abraham and his son Isaac. And uh, Isaac has the bundle on his back, and he says, "Uh, Dad, I got the wood, and we got the fire, but where's the sacrifice? And with a tear in his eye, Abraham says, God will provide the lamb. They get up to the top of the hill, and boy, it doesn't look good. It looks like Isaac is going to lose his life. But the angel steps in, and God says, no, don't you touch him, because I'm going to provide a substitute. You need to think about that. That's part of beholding the lamb. Think about that substitute on that hill. We are redeemed by the blood of the lamb. We are bought back by the blood of the Lamb. We are not killed. We are spared. We are saved because of the blood of the Lamb. We are redeemed by the, by the Lamb and His blood. In Revelation chapter 5, we see a Lamb as it had been slain. And it is through His death that we are set free. So the first picture is Cain and Abel. The second picture is Abraham. And the third picture is found in Exodus chapter 12. And it's the Passover lamb. Remember that story? The Lord is going to send uh, the angel of death over the land of Egypt. And what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to take that little Passover lamb and you're supposed to kill that lamb, eat that lamb that night. Everybody in the house, don't leave anything. Take the lamb in. That little lamb is going to die. You're going to take him in. And then when the death angel comes by, you are going to survive. You're going you're to be saved. <clears throat> and that's what happened, isn't it? in the homes of those people that took the Passover lamb, killed it, ate it, they were saved. But in the homes of those people that refused the lamb and would not take it and eat it, death came to their homes. In this picture, we see that there is power over death in the blood of the lamb. Passover signifies salvation for those who participate. Once a month we have communion here and it's kind of a, uh, a variant of the, what the Jews have done for years in their Passover ceremony. We remember the leavened bread and Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for you and we drink the little grape juice and this is the uh, blood. It represents the blood in my, uh, that I shed for you. 
So those three pictures, those are the ones I want you to think about. When I say today, the title of this message, Behold the Lamb, what do, what do I mean by that? Is I want you to think about those three things. Think about Cain and Abel and the Lamb. Think about Abraham and Isaac and the Lamb. And think about the children of Israel as they're getting ready to be freed from the power of Egypt and think about the lamb. And then think about Jesus. Abigail, you recorded my little song. Behold the lamb of God lying in the hay. Behold the lamb of God, the life, the truth, the way. Behold the lamb of God. Now I can't even remember the rest of it. You know it better. What's that? Who takes, Who takes our sins away. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb. Here he is. Jesus. He comes. He's the Lamb of God. And where is he born? In a stable. <laughs> it's a perfect picture. Now, it wasn't really a lamb, you know, like, he wasn't really that. But it was a picture of him. It was a way for you to think of him. And now, here he is. He's going to die on the cross. Well, wait a second. I don't remember any lamb dying on a cross, right? Not a real lamb. But... They died by having their throats cut. Actually, the lambs that were sacrificed, Abel's lamb, the lamb on Mount Moriah and the Passover lamb, they were, they were slaughtered with mercy, right? But Jesus was not slaughtered in that way. They devised the most cruel, wicked way they could to kill him. And uh, he died on that cross and he rose again, the Lamb of God. Think about that. The last thing you can think about is one day when you're in heaven, you will see a lamb as it had been slain <laughs> there at the throne. And this Lamb of God is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we will be able to see him and behold him. But by faith, we do it now. Well, let me just read one last thing here. <clears throat> Verse 27. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Jesus knew what he was about. And he knew that he was the lamb that had come to be slain. That by his blood... Your sins and my sins could be taken away. Well, by faith in that blood. Father, we do thank you for your goodness to us. And this morning, we're, we've just been beholding you and thinking about you. You came for that purpose in mind. To die on the cross for us so that our sins would be forgiven. And we'd be cleansed from those sins. And we could live for eternity with you. We could be set free from Egypt. That we could be untied and... And we would be taken off the altar, Lord, but you would be our substitute. And that, Lord, we would be made acceptable to you. Now, Father, I pray for each person here that you would bless them, help them to think about these things all day long. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.